Welcome to Lecture 3. Uh, this will be the last of our introductory lectures in which we will concentrate exclusively on linear algebra, but that doesn't mean we won't return to that topic uh, in subsequent lectures if uh, it's necessary. Now you might recall that at the end of Lecture 2 in the problems, um, in fact in my hint for the third problem on the second quiz, I challenged you to think about the following. I said uh, something along the lines of find a basis for X which is equal to the set of all vectors in R3 such that x plus 2y plus 3z is equal to 0. And I gave you a hint which was that the dimension of x is equal to 2. And the uh, reason that that is a useful thing to know is that it tells you how many vectors will be in the basis. Remember that that's always true. If you want to know the dimension for any space, that's simply equal to the number of vectors in any basis for that space. So in this case, we're looking for two vectors that will form a basis for x. In other words, we're looking for two vectors, uh, let's call it v1 and v2, and these must have the property that any vector in x can be written in terms of those two vectors. In fact, let's write that down to make sure we're all together. So, um, we want to find two vectors v1 and v2 such that any vector in x could be expressed as a linear combination of v1 and v2. In other words, for any vector v in x, there must be some scalars alpha and beta such that v is equal to alpha v1 plus beta v2. Okay, so that's what we're looking for, and um, I don't know, maybe at first that seems like a uh, somewhat um, daunting task, but it turns out to be very easy. In fact, and, and this is part of what, you know, to me makes linear algebra very interesting, it's almost like magic in a way, because it turns out that we can pick any two vectors in X, and as long as they are not a multiple, as long as neither one of them is a multiple of the other one, then they will work. So let me show you what I mean here. So um, I'll pick as my first vector, I'll pick V1 is equal to uh, 3, 0, negative 1. 
Now that's just a, an arbitrary pick. Uh, I will admit though that there's one thing I've done there uh, which you might want to do in situations like this as well and that is if you can it's always useful to make at least one of the coordinates equal to zero. And so that's what I've done here is I've made the y coordinate equal to zero and uh, so I get the vector 3, 0, negative 1. Now I claim, uh, again, I claim that if I pick any vector v2 uh, in x, it will work as long as v2 is not a multiple of v1 and v1 is not a multiple of v2. Okay? So keeping in the spirit of trying to make at least one of the components equal to zero, uh, what we might do is say, well, let's pick v2 equal to 2, negative 1, 0. Notice that in v2, the z component is 0. And let me make sure you understand here exactly what I'm saying. Uh, how do I know that v1 and v2 are vectors in x? Well, because they satisfy the condition for x, which is that x plus 2y plus 3z is equal to 0. Notice that both of those vectors, v1 and v2, satisfy that condition. And furthermore, it's very clear that v1 is not a multiple of v2, v2 is not a multiple of v1. So I claim that the set consisting of those two vectors is a basis for X. And now let's try to verify that. Okay, and remember that the verification consists of two things. Show that any vector in X can be written as a linear combination of V1 and V2. That's one part. And then the second part is show that uh, this set of vectors is minimal. In other words, if we if we took one of them away, then we could not write all the vectors in X in terms of the one remaining vector. But as long as we have both of them, then we can write all the vectors in X in terms of those two. Okay, so let's see how this will go. Well, let's pick a general uh, XYZ vector in X. How do we express this vector in terms of V1 and V2. 
Well, uh, let's see what happens. We have X, Y, Z is equal to alpha V1 plus beta V2. And what we want to show here is that we can find formulas for alpha and beta that will always make this work. So alpha uh, times V1, well, V1 is 3, 0, negative 1. And V2 is 2, negative 1, 0. And therefore, we have 3 alpha plus 2 beta for the first component minus beta for the second component and minus alpha for the third component. And that vector here on the right hand side must be equal to this vector over here on the left hand side. And so you can see uh, for those vectors to be equal to each other each component must be the same. So we have x is equal to 3 alpha plus 2 beta y is equal to minus beta and z is minus alpha and therefore uh, you see how our choice of making the y component of the of v1 equal to zero and the z component of the second vector zero has led to simple expressions here for the y and z component which in turn has allowed us now to solve for alpha and beta very easily. We find that beta is equal to negative y and alpha is equal to negative z. And therefore we already have uh, the result that we had sought and that is the vector x, y, z is equal to alpha, which is negative z, times 3, 0, negative 1, plus beta, which is negative y, times 2, negative 1, 0. This is the way that we can express any vector. This is how we can express any vector in X in terms of V1 and V2. Now that may seem like magic to you. Uh, like I said, I mean, uh, notice that we didn't think about the X component there at all, but it will surely work out. Let me show you what I mean. Let's, let's look again at this equation. Remember that the equation for X, for the set X, is that it's all vectors here such that the x component plus 2 times the y component plus 3 times the z component is 0. So let's come down here. Let's, let's pick another arbitrary vector in x. Remember now we must obey that the x component plus 2 times the y component plus 3 times the z component is equal to 0. But as long as we pick that we're okay. So let's maybe pick, uh, uh, maybe uh, I'll pick z is equal to 1 and y is equal to 2. And so if we pick that, then this equation would say uh, x plus 4 plus 3 is equal to 0. So that would mean that x is negative 7. And therefore... Um, negative 7 2 1 is an element 
of x. And if we if we check that, we can see that it's certainly true because if we check to see x plus 2y plus 3z, well, x is negative 7 plus 2 times 2 is 4. Negative 7 and 4 is negative 3. And then negative 3 plus 3 times 1 is positive 3. So negative 3 and positive 3 is indeed 0. So that verifies that this vector is indeed in x. And what I'm claiming, so I'm claiming with our uh, formula up here, that that vector, negative 7, 2, 1, must be equal to the negative of its z component, so that's negative 1, times the vector 3, 0, negative 1, and then minus its y component, so minus 2, times the vector 2, negative 1, 0. I claim that that's true because of this formula right here. Now, does it all work out? Well, let's see. Negative 1 times the first vector would give us negative 3, 0, positive 1. And then negative 2 times that second vector will give us negative 4, positive 2, 0. And now when we add these two vectors together, we get negative 7, negative 2, 1, sure enough. So like magic, this has all worked out. Now, of course, it's, it's not really magic. Um, and we can, I mean, if you're interested in knowing the inner workings of this a little bit better, you can see why it all works out in the following way. Uh, now, 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 what I've done is is complete now. I have shown, before we move on, I want to make sure you understand. I have shown that any arbitrary vector, x, y, z, any vector in the subspace x, uh, can be expressed in terms of 3, 0, negative 1, and 2, negative 1, 0, by this formula right here. So this is for sure... Uh, I've, I've shown that that will work out. Um, maybe, maybe I need to show you, I, I'm still going to show you why the X component works out. It's clear why the Z and the Y components work out. I'll show you why the X component works out in just a moment. And as far as um, 3, 0, negative 1, and 2, negative 1, 0 being a minimal set uh, is concerned, I think that that's pretty clear simply because these vectors are not multiples of each other. So, if we had just one of them, if we took all the vectors that were a linear combination of one of them, we would just have a straight line. But when we take all linear combinations of both of them, we have a plane, and that is indeed what this um, set is, the set of all vectors who satisfy, uh, or which satisfy this equation, is indeed a plane. Another way of saying, or, or another way of showing that if we took one of these away, it would not be, uh, what would be left over would not be sufficient is to say, well, if we took 2, negative 1, 0 away, we know 2, negative 1, 0 is a vector in X, but we can't express it as a linear combination of 3, 0, negative 1. So that shows 3, 0, negative 1 alone is not sufficient. And likewise, if we took 3, 0, negative 1 away, and we're left with just 2, negative 1, 0, that would not be sufficient because the 3, 0, negative 1 is a vector in x, and it could not be expressed in terms of 2, negative 1, 0. So both of these vectors, or, or let's say two vectors, that are in x, and neither of which is a multiple of the other, are needed, and these two will do. Now let's come back down here to this formula, and you can see... Um, a little bit better why it works out. Let's come down here. Okay, we have x, y, z is equal to negative z times 3, 0, negative 1, minus y times 2, 
negative 1, 0. Now, why is it that this formula works? Well, let's investigate. The first vector is the same as minus 3z, 0, z. And the second vector is the same as minus 2y, y, 0. Now, when we add these two vectors together, we get minus 2y minus 3z y z. Now, if you compare that vector, well, what we have on the left is clear that the second components do indeed match, and it's clear that the third components do indeed match. But what about those first components? We have x over here, and we have negative 2y minus 3z over here. So it doesn't look like those match. But keep in mind that this vector here was chosen to be an arbitrary vector in x. And what does that mean? Well, we can say since this vector is in x, We know that x plus 2y plus 3z must be 0, because that's how we choose our vectors in x. And what does that mean? That means that x is equal to minus 2y minus 3z. So we could plug that in right up there, and we see that this vector is indeed equal to x, y, z. So it's not, uh, once we see that, the, the magic sort of disappears there, and we see why this all works out. So that's how we could find a basis for uh, the vector space x. And once again, really, it's very, very easy. All you have to do is to find any two vectors in X that satisfy this condition and uh, such that neither is a multiple of the other. And that will do. Now, uh, in the arbitrary case, it would be a little more difficult than that because, keep in mind, I did help you out by telling you the dimension of this was 2. Uh, in general, if you were just given some arbitrary subspace then and you wanted to find a basis then the first thing you would you might try to do is to find its dimension and why would you want to find that out because then you would know how many vectors you're looking for but let's say that you were uh, working in some large subspace and let's say you you uh, wanted to find a basis and somehow you figured out the dimension was seven then you then what would happen well you'd have some equations describing, uh, you know, just like you have this one equation which would um, give you the conditions for vectors in X. Well, you would have some equation or possibly multiple equations uh, in that case uh, describing the vectors in this seven-dimensional subspace and you would simply f have to find seven vectors that satisfied those conditions and uh, such that none of them could be written in terms of the other six. Now, of course, that would be that could be quite a task, and you don't have to worry. We're not going to be doing anything like that in this course, but, but that would be the idea. So uh, uh, maybe before we move on, Uh, we should look at one more example of this. Let's say maybe uh, find a basis for uh, x plus uh, 2y minus z equals 0. Oh, I'm sorry, this is an equation here. I wonder what I want to say is... Uh, 
find a basis for x equals set of all x, y, z in R3 such that uh, x x uh, plus 2y minus z equals 0. So, um, uh, try to do this. Stop the video now. Try to do it on your own. And then I'll do it myself. But keep in mind that um, there's not a unique answer here. So, even if we come up with different answers, that doesn't mean that either of us is wrong. But stop the video now. I encourage you to stop the video. And then, uh, after you think you have a, a good answer, let's come back and look at it together. Okay. So, um, what I would do here is, again, I want to pick V1 and V2, and as usual, I'll try to pick them in such a way that some components are zero. So, I'll pick V1 equal to 1, 0, 1, and I'll pick uh, V2 equal to 0, 1, 2. Now clearly V1 satisfies this condition. V2 satisfies this condition. So V1 and V2 are clearly in X and neither is a multiple of the other. And, and by the way, I'm telling you again, uh, again, I'll give you the hint, which you might have already figured out since it's so similar to the uh, previous example, that the dimension of this X is also 2. So I claim that uh, this is a basis. And uh, again, to verify it, okay, we'll pick X, Y, Z in X and show how to express it. In terms of V1 and V2. Okay? So uh, we'll have X, Y, Z is equal to alpha V1 plus beta V2, which is alpha times 101 plus beta times 012 which is um, alpha, zero alpha, plus zero beta, two beta, which is alpha, beta, alpha plus two beta. And uh, now, again, we want this factor to be equal to the vector on the left and so that tells us immediately that alpha must be chosen to be equal to x and beta must be chosen to be equal to y and I claim that if we will make that choice everything will work out so uh, let's uh, let's see okay so x y z I'm claiming is equal to x times 101 plus y times 0, 1, 2. This is 
I claim that this is the way that we can express any vector in the subspace X in terms of the vectors V1, which is 101, and V2, which is 012. And so now I simply want to verify to you that it will work out. Well, x times 101 is x, 0, x. And y times 0, 1, 2 is 0, y, 2y. And so when we add those together, we get x, y, x, plus 2y. And so clearly we see that the first component works out. Clearly we see that the second component works out. But what about this third component? We have z on the left hand side. We have x plus 2y on the right hand side. But remember now this vector xyz was chosen to be a vector in x and for all vectors in x, x plus 2y minus z is 0. x plus 2y minus z is 0, which implies that z, if we keep z on one side and take the x and 2y over to the other, z is equal to x plus 2y. And there we have it, because here is x plus 2y, and so indeed this is equal to x, y, z. And so, therefore, any arbitrary vector x, y, z in the space x can be expressed in this way in terms of our vectors v1 and v2, and furthermore, v1 and v2, neither one of those can be expressed as a multiple of the other. So v1 and v2 do constitute a basis for this space x. And that's it. That, that's, uh, you know, uh, the ideas may be new to some of you, but I think it's uh, after you look at it, you see it's a fairly straightforward idea. And so um, now let's investigate another property. And uh, that property will be called orthogonality. Before we talk about orthogonality, uh, we need to introduce the idea of a dot product or inner product. So, um, let's proceed in this way. Uh, let's suppose that uh, V1 um, Well, here, we'll suppose V1 and V2 are elements of uh, Rn. And what this means is that each one is a vector with n components, n real components. So, for instance, we would have V1 is equal to x. 1, 1, well, uh, x, 1, 2, x, 1, 3, dot, 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 down to x, 1, n. That might be the components of V1. And V2 could be x, 2, 1, x, 2, 2, x, 2, 3, dot, 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 down to x, 2, n. And the dot product of v1 and v2 is, I'll put a delta over it to, to mean that this is defined to be equal to x, 1, 1 times x, 2, 1. 
plus x12 times x22 plus dot 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 plus x1n times x2n. So you just uh, multiply the first components together, the second components together, the third components together, and so on, and then add up all of those products, and you get in the total will be the uh, dot product or inner product of V1 and V2. And this is a, an idea that I imagine that all of you have seen before, uh, but still we can look at a couple of quick examples. If uh, perhaps we're looking in R3 uh, and we had that uh, V1 is equal to perhaps 1, 2, 3 and V2 is the vector 4, 5, 6 then V1 dot V2 is equal to 1 times 4 plus 2 times 5 plus 3 times 6 which is equal to 4 plus 10 plus 18 and that is equal to 32 now there are, the, the reason that we have a dot product is it has it has some interesting uh, properties uh, one is that the dot product allows us to calculate the length of a vector. Let's suppose that, uh, well, let's look at the example that we just had. The length, the, the, this symbol now, in some books you'll see just um, one bar, and rather than these <coughs> double bars used on each side, in some books you'll see just one bar but I like to use two bars uh, to distinguish this from absolute value uh, you know the, of course you don't take the absolute value of a vector but sometimes it can be um, helpful just to have the double bars to remind you that you uh, that V in this case is or V1 in this case is a vector anyway um, the magnitude or length of a vector length of V1 it's also called the magnitude of V1 and it is equal to the square root of V1 dotted with itself so in this case uh, for the V1 that we have here it would be the square root of 1 times 1 plus 2 times 2 plus 3 times 3 or uh, 1 times 1 is 1 and 4 is 5 and 9 is 14 and similarly the magnitude of V2 in this particular case would be the square root of 4 times 4 plus 5 times 5 plus 6 times 6 which would be 16 and 25 is 41 and 36 is square root 77. So the dot product or the inner product gives us a way to calculate the length of a vector. And then another important concept about uh, the dot product is the following. V1 dotted with V2 is equal to the magnitude of V1 times the magnitude of V2 times the cosine of the angle between them so for instance if this is if these are the two vectors V1 and V2 and they are notice their ta their tails are connected here then uh, we call this angle theta and the relationship between the cosine of that angle and the lengths of the vectors and the dot product of the two vectors is given by this equation which is rather important 
and notice that uh, this could be manipulated into this form And so now we are finally ready to talk about orthogonality. Uh, V1 and V2 are said to be orthogonal to each other. If V1 dot V2 is equal to zero. And so in uh, in the present case that would mean uh, it, in, in this present case orthogonality means exactly the same thing as perpendicularity. The two vectors are perpendicular to each other and we can see that because if uh, we can see that here from this equation if v1 dot v2 is zero then that means the cosine of the angle between the vectors is zero, which would mean that the angle is 90 degrees. So that's what we will mean by orthogonality of two vectors, is that their inner product is zero. And, um, um, Let's ask, why are we interested in orthogonality? Well, one reason for being interested in orthogonality is the following idea. Uh, uh, let's suppose that... Um, well, let's just keep this simple and let's say, note that 1, 0 well, let me maybe start over in a different way. Okay, let's read this now. So, if we, uh, this is an example now. We're trying to understand why we're interested in orthogonality. And so the example is as follows. We have a vector v1, which is 1, 0, and another vector v2, which is 0, 1. And I claim that uh, those two vectors taken together form a basis for R2. Now that's the first part of what I'm claiming, and I think that that's very clear. Uh, we've talked about that before, but any vector in R2 could be written as alpha times this first vector plus beta times the second vector. That's clear. For instance, the vector, let's, let's pick a vector in R2. Let's say maybe 5, 7. Well, 5, 7 is equal to 5v1 plus 7v2. So, uh, clearly, any vector in R2 could be written as a sum, a linear combination of those two vectors. But furthermore, in addition to that, this basis has the property that the vectors in it 
are orthogonal to each other. Now, why is that useful? Well, uh, in order to understand why it's useful, I need to get another basis in which that's not true, and then you can see which one is more convenient to use. So, uh, let's um, come up with another basis. I'll say, note that if V1 equals 1, 1, and V2 equals 2, negative 7, then V1, uh, actually, uh, let me call these V3 and V4. So that's V3 and V4. Then V3, V4 is a basis for R3, excuse me, R2, and that this basis consists of vectors that are not orthogonal to each other. Um, now, I'll show in a moment that this really is a basis. In other words, I'll show that any vector in R2 can be written as a linear combination of V3 and V4. And it's clear that any basis of R2, we've already said, R2 is two-dimensional, so any basis must have two vectors. So we couldn't get by with less than uh, two vectors, so we must have V3 and V4 both. But... Uh, so, so I'll show that part in a moment that this really is a basis. Now, the part that it's the, these vectors are not orthogonal to each other is easy because if we take the dot product of V3 and V4, what do we get? 1 times 2 is 2, plus 1 times negative 7 is negative 7, 2, and negative 7 is negative 5. So the dot product of V3 and V4 is not equal to 0. It's equal to negative 5. And therefore, these vectors are not orthogonal to each other. So now the question is, why might one prefer the first basis over the second one? And an answer is... Uh, it is much easier to express an arbitrary vector in terms of orthogonal vectors than it is to express one in terms of non-orthogonal vectors. And let's see that that's true. So I'll take an arbitrary, so uh, I'll say demonstration. Suppose that we wanted to express uh, 7, 11 well, of course this is not an arbitrary vector, but 
you get the point. This is a specific letter. But uh, seven, Express 711, uh, in terms, well, I'll say first, in terms of um, V1 and V2, and then in terms of V3 and V4. Okay? Well, in terms of V1 and V2, nothing could be easier. 711 is equal to 7 times 1, 0 plus 11 times 0, 1, which is 7V1 plus 11V2. But what if we want to express 711 in terms of V3 and V4? Well, we get 711 is equal to alpha times 1, 1 plus beta times 2, negative 7. And so this would be uh, alpha plus 2 beta and alpha minus 7 beta and so we end up having to solve this system of equations 7 is equal to alpha plus 2 beta and 11 is equal to alpha minus 7 beta and admittedly I mean it's not too hard to solve that system of equations but this is a lot more work uh, finding the coefficients in this case than it was in this case. Now you might be saying, well, that's not a really good comparison because um, these two vectors have the advantage, V1 and V2 have the advantage that each one has one component equal to zero. But let me show you that um, even if that were not the case, it would still be easy to find the coefficients as long as the vectors and the bases are orthogonal to each other. So let's look at another, uh, one more example. Note that V5, which is equal to 1 over square root of 2, 1 over square root of 2 and V6 which is equal to 1 over square root of 2 minus 1 over square root of 2 is another basis well I'm sorry let me rephrase this a little bit I'll say note that if V5 equals 1 over square root of 2, 1 over square root of 2, and v6 is equal to 1 over square root of 2 minus, square root, minus 1 over square root of 2, then v5, v6 is a basis for R2 consisting of um, orthogonal vectors. Now we will see how easy it is to express Seven eleven in terms of these vectors. So we just found above that it was very easy to express seven eleven in terms of one zero and zero one, but rather tedious to express seven eleven in terms of the non orthogonal vectors one one and two negative seven. But let me show you now that 
as long as we pick two orthogonal vectors, it's always going to be easy. It doesn't have to, we don't have to have vectors with zero components. It will always be easy as long as the vectors we choose are mutually orthogonal. And let's see why that's true. Okay, so we have 7, 11 is equal to alpha times 1 over square root of 2, 1 over square root of 2, plus beta times 1 over square root of 2, minus 1 over square root of 2. Or we could also write alpha v1 plus beta v2. Now, instead of expanding this and getting a system of equations as before, we're going to do something smarter. We're going to say, we're going to take the dot product of each side of this equation with v1. Now remember, these two vectors, oh, and I'm sorry, it shouldn't be v1 and v2, but v5 and v6 here. So v5, v6, v5, and v6. Okay? Now, notice that, as, as, as we said, v5 and v6 are orthogonal to each other. In other words, if we take the dot product of v5 with v6, we get 0. And you can see that. 1 over square root of 2 times 1 over square root of 2 is 1 half. 1 over square root of 2 times minus 1 over square root of 2 is minus 1 half. 1 half minus 1 half is 0. So that means that when we come down here and try to express the vector 7, 11 in terms of v5 and v6, Okay, we get alpha v5 plus beta v6, but then if we, if we take the dot product of both sides of v5, this term right here, since v6 dotted with v5 is 0, that will disappear, and we just get alpha times v5 dot v5, or alpha times the length of v5 squared. So that means that that implies that alpha is equal to 7, 11, oh, I'm sorry, it's equal to 7, 11 dotted with V5 over V5 dot V5. And similarly, beta would be equal to 7, 11 dot V6 over v6 dot v6 and both of these we can compute very quickly uh, 7 11 dotted with v5 would be 7 times the square root of 2 plus 11 times the square root of 2 so that's 18 I said times the square root of 2 I meant over the square root of 2 so that's 18 over the square root of 2 and then in the bottom v5 dotted with v5 is 1 over square root of 2 times 1 over square root of 2, so that's 1 half, plus 1 over square root of 2 times 1 over square root of 2 is 1 half, so it's just 1. And for uh, uh, beta, 7 times 1 over square root of 2 is 7 over square root of 2 minus 11, so we have minus 4 over square root of 2, and v6 dot v6 happens to be 1 as well, and so we're done. Uh, alpha is 18 over the square root of 2 and beta is minus 4 over the square root of 2. And notice that we didn't have to solve any system of equations at all. We got immediate formulas for the coefficients alpha and beta and that happened simply because when we use this expression and then dotted each side of the equation with either v5 or v6. When we dot each side with v6, this term dropped out. On the other hand, if we had dotted, uh, excuse me, that's when we dot each side with v5. On the other hand, if we had dotted each side with v6, then this would be v6 dot v5. This would be v6 dot v6. And so we get this equation. So when you use, when you have a basis consisting of orthogonal vectors, it makes it much easier to express some arbitrary vector in terms of the, uh, those basis vectors.
and uh, we will see in the book that uh, we are very uh, we're almost always going to be working with bases that do consist of orthogonal vectors and and in fact not only orthogonal but orthonormal vectors which means that the vectors are all orthogonal to each other and all of them have a length of one that was the case here in this last example notice that v5 uh, dot v5 was one v6 dot v6 was one and this made it even more convenient to work with so that's a brief introduction to the ideas of uh, uh, orthogonality and uh, also a continuation we wrap up the uh, notion of a basis so now um, let's look at problems for this video okay so our problems will be as follows for uh, 3.1 we're given a subspace which consists of all vectors in R3 that satisfy x plus 2y plus 3z is equal to 0 and you want to circle each of the following that is an orthonormal basis for x now just to review the orthonormal means orthonormal basis means it's not only a basis for x but also the vectors in the basis are orthogonal to each other and they have a length each of them has a length of one so here are your choices for a b c and d and um, i believe all that's clear but i'll just read it quickly so for uh, a the two vectors are three over square root of ten zero minus one over square root of ten 1 over square root of 35 minus 5 over the square root of 35, 3 over square root of 35. For B, it's 3 over square root of 10, 0 minus 1 over square root of 10, 2 over square root of 5 minus 1 over square root of 5, 0. For C, it's 3 over square root of 10, 0 minus 1 over square root of 10, 1 over square root of 35 minus 5 over the square root of 35, this is a 5, and 3 over the square root of 35 and 0, 0, 0. And finally for D, 2 over square root of 5 minus 1 over square root of 5, 0, 3 over square root of 70, 6 over the square root of 70, and minus 5 over the square root of 70. So identify all of those that are orthonormal bases for X. Number uh, 3.2, what is the angle between 1, 2, and 2, 1? And you have the choices 36.87 degrees, 45 degrees, 20 degrees, 90 degrees, and 3.3 will be given in class. And that concludes uh, both this video and our introduction to linear algebra. And so on our next video, we will begin working on problems in our book. So uh, good luck.